Hi everyone. This video series will take you through our recommended process using Microsoft's cloud computing offering, Microsoft Azure. However, you could also deploy the technology stack locally if you prefer. Microsoft is generously supporting the challenge by providing students with free Azure credit so that you can run your environment in the cloud for free. It's also a great opportunity to learn about one of the major paradigm shifts in the global technology space, cloud. The steps we'll take are, step one, creating an Azure for Students subscription. Step two, deploying the resources to run your analysis environment and running a test Jupyter notebook in the environment. Step three, getting started with challenge one and submitting your results to the EY data science platform. In Azure, everything that you will do will fall under a subscription. It's how you pay for resources. And in this case, a free Azure subscription, which will be provided to you. The first step is creating an Azure for Students subscription, which is a three step process. First, create a new Outlook.com email account. Second, redeem your student verification code. And third, Activate your subscription. Create a new Outlook.com email account. Open a new in private browser session and navigate to signup.live.com. There, create a new Outlook.com email account. Click on Get a new email address button. Add an email address you would like to use. If the username is not available, Microsoft will offer several suggestions. Create a new passport, password for the account. Add in your name, country, region, and the date of birth, and validate um, your entry. The account will be created. Redeeming your Microsoft Azure for Student Verification Code. You will hopefully have received a student code for the Azure credit via the email address that you used to register for the challenge. To use this code, open a new in private browser session and navigate to aka.ms forward slash Azure for students. Click the activate now button to get started. Enter your account login information and select sign in. Verify your identity with a phone number. Choose a verification method as verification code. Enter your 25 character verification code, then click verify academic status. It may, up, may take up to five minutes to process the redemption. This is the code that you should have received when you registered for the challenge. Activate your subscription. When, you, when the redemption process is completed, it will direct you to the sign up page. Enter the account information and click next. Click the agreement checkbox and click the sign up button. It may take up to five minutes to process the request. Your Azure subscription is ready to be used through the Azure portal. Finally, you can check the balance of your Azure Pass credits. Next, you'll create a data science environment where you'll do your analysis and create your solution to the challenge. Under your new subscription, you can organize your services, for example, virtual machines, storage, and databases into resource groups. Think of resource groups as containers to contain everything you need for a project. This makes it easier for you to remove unused resources as groups. You simply delete the resource group if you're done with the project or want to start a new one. Creating the environment is called deploying a resource group on Azure. In our case, we'll deploy from a template that contains everything you need to complete the challenge. To begin the process, you'll need to be logged into Azure with the account that the Azure for Students subscription is on. This is the Outlook.com email you created previously. Navigate to portal.azure.com to go to the Azure portal. 
Now let's go through deploying the cube in a box environment. Firstly, we'll need to create an SSH key. You can do this by searching for SSH in the search bar. Click on the Create button. Here you will have to create a new resource group for this project. Let's call it Cube in a Box. Set the region to Australia East. Assign a name to the SSH public key and hit Review and Create. Finally, hit Create to create the SSH key. In the pop up box, click on Download Private Key and Create Resource. Once the key has been created, click on Go to Resource. Your public key will be shown on screen. With this page open, open a new tab and go to this GitHub repository. Scroll down to the README and click on the Deploy to Azure magic link. For the resource group, select the one we created earlier. Next, you need to enter the SSH key we created earlier. Simply go back to the previous tab and copy and paste the public key. Lastly, you need to enter a secret password. Make sure you note this down for future reference. Then click on the Review and Create button. And then finally the Create button. The instance will now start deploying. This should roughly take 25 to 30 minutes. Now that the instance has been deployed, let's test if it was successful. Click on Go to Resource Group and then select the Virtual Machine. Copy the public IP address and then paste it into a new tab. Once you hit enter and the page loads, you should see Jupyter Notebook. Click on the DataCube Viewer Notebook. Hit the Run button twice to run the Python script. In a few seconds, you should see a map appear in the output. This means you have successfully deployed the Open Data Cube instance. You are now ready to get started on the Data Science Challenge. At this point, the VM is running and consuming credits. You can verify the VM's status by navigating to Overview in the Azure portal for the VM. Make sure you're looking at the VM specifically, not the resource group as a whole, which contains a number of other components. Once you've finished work for the day, you should click Stop on the VM. This will release the computing resources back into the Azure pool for other Microsoft customers and stop charging you credits. When you're ready to start work again the next day, come back to this page and click Start. Starting and stopping your VM is crucial to avoid running out of credits before you finish the challenge. The first time you click Stop, you will be asked if you would like to reserve the public IP address. While this attracts a small charge, we recommend doing this for new users as it's easier to connect to the VM if the address is always the same. If you don't select this, 
you'll just need to come back here each time you start the VM and get the new IP address that has been assigned to it. Before we continue, we are going to set up auto shutdown on your VM. This is an optional step, but can save your VM running for weeks without you realizing if you forget to turn it off. Go to the overview page of your VM. Scroll down to auto shutdown on the left. Click enable and select the time zone and time that you want the VM to switch off. It will switch off automatically, so it can be a good idea to turn on email notifications to avoid losing unsaved work in case you're still working at that time. Remember that you can check the balance of your Azure Pass credits at any time. Congratulations, you have successfully deployed your data science environment on Microsoft Azure and learned how to manage it to use your credits effectively. Now we'll get stuck into the data science problem itself. Jump back into your VM via its public IP address. If you switched it off earlier, you'll need to switch it back on before you can access it. When you land on Jupyter, you should see a number of folders. The first two contain example code and tutorials to help you learn more about the Open Data Cube Python package and the ways you can use it to help solve the challenge. We strongly recommend going back to these resources after completing this video before continuing your analysis. The second two folders contain the resources for each of the two challenges. We'll go through the first one today. Open the O3EY Challenge 1 folder and double click on the Challenge 1 Getting Started file to open the notebook in a new tab. We're now going to work through each of the sections in turn. Scroll down to the Import Library cell and run the cell. To run a cell in Jupyter Notebooks, click in the cell and hit Control Enter on your keyboard, or click Run up the top. This cell imports other useful pieces of code called libraries that people have written previously that we are going to use in this notebook. Run the next cell. This cell creates a data cube object, which we will use to access raster data such as satellite and line scan images. Next, we'll check what line scan data is available. This cell queries the data cube object we created earlier and returns a list of all the line scan data sets that we have available. Note that this doesn't return the actual image data, just the metadata such as the name and coordinates. We can see that the total number of line scan data sets available for analysis is 134. In the next cell, we use the dc.load function to return the first line scan in the list we got previously. Now, we are returning the actual image data, not just the metadata. We then plot the data and can see a mountainous region with three or four spot fires. Images are basically big tables of values where each value represents some degree of available light and this is presented to us as variations in color. In this case, the line scan images were taken with an infrared camera. So the values represent the amount of infrared light available at each pixel. The brighter areas where there is more light are the fires. Because we specified the EPSG 28355 coordinate system and a resolution of 10 by 10 in the query, the data is returned in cells of 10 by 10 meters. The data set has dimensions of 1956 by 1902 cells, or about 19 kilometers by 19 kilometers. The next cell reads from a CSV called challenge one underscore train from the resources folder which contains a list of the training images. You can see that there are 129 rows in the CSV, correlating with 129 line scans out of the 134 that were available via the data cube object that we queried earlier. The remaining five images are the test set that we'll get to later. Now we'll import and display the polygons showing the fire edges these are annotations which have been created by the Country Fire Authority, or CFA, in Victoria, Australia. They show the map of each fire at various stages of the event. This is the data variable which we will later try to predict from the line scan images, also known 
as the ground truth. Printing the metadata attached to the polygons shows the fields that are attached to each polygon object, for example, source name, which roughly correlates to the label field of each line scan. Running map underscore shapefile shows where the polygons are located. You can see there are a number of different fire events. Each polygon has been created from one or more line scans, and they can mostly be matched up using the metadata. Let's investigate that now. To use the polygons as ground truth annotations as a target variable for a machine learning model, we first need to identify which polygons are relevant to which line scan. Many of them share a common key under the source name and label fields. However, there are some subtle differences in the text formatting. You can see that the label field from the line scan data is all capitals with spaces replaced with underscores when compared to the source name field. There are a subset of polygons which were derived from multiple line scans that were taken near each other, particularly for larger fires. These contain the word composite or some punctuation such as a comma or ampersand. There were 12 unique line scan combinations used for composite polygons identified, in, identified using this method we have shown here. To allow for matching between the source name and label fields, we first have to reformat the source name. Here, Let's define a function to modify a text string like this. First, we define the function, then we test that it works. We now apply the function to the entire data set and create a new column called source name clean. At the same time, we are converting the date time string into an actual date time object that can be sorted and filtered, for example, based on time rather than just the characters in the string we can review the results in the metadata table. Now, let's look at the polygons that match directly with the line scan we loaded previously. Let's select all the polygon objects that have the same source name clean value as the label field of the line scan data set. We do this by filtering using the dot lock method. We'll also load the line scan data set again into a new variable called source or src and now we'll plot them together you can see that the polygons with a source name clean value that matched the label value of the line scan are shown as red lines these are annotations encapsulating the bright yellow spots on the line scan image these areas were on fire at the time the line scan was taken next we'll turn our polygons into a mask that matches the dimensions of the line scan. This may be a more useful format for image analysis or training a machine learning model. Here, you can see the raw line scan image on the left and the target mask, which was created from the polygons on the right. Now, we'll apply a simple thresholding process to the line scan to try and isolate the areas of the image that are on fire. Remember that ultimately, our goal is to be able to take a line scan image, apply some process to it, and return a map of where the fire is in the image. Crude but effective, this thresholding process has been relatively successful. Now, we'll go through making a submission to the EY Data Science platform. First, we read from another CSV file called challenge1 underscore test which contains a list of coordinates that we need to evaluate as either on fire or not on fire. While the challenge is to return a map of where the fire is in each line scan, the way we are actually scoring this is as a classification problem. Classify the state of each coordinate pair in the test set as either on fire or not on fire. The next cell shows how to use the dot cell method where you pass in an X and a Y coordinate and it returns the value at that address. We'll use this to iterate over the list of test coordinates and get their values to determine whether each coordinate is on fire or not. We start with the names of the test line scan images. 
and then loop over each line scan. First loading the data from the data cube, creating the mask using our thresholding process, and then looping over all the test coordinates for that line scan. In this inner loop, we use the dot cell method to get the value of the mask at that coordinate pair. Because our mask is formatted as logical values that are true or false, we need to convert them to integers for scoring on the EY Data Science platform. We'll do a quick check to see that our values make sense. And now we'll write our results to a new CSV. Well done. You have a submission file that we can upload to the platform for scoring. On your other tab, navigate back to the Jupyter Notebooks folder where the Getting Started Notebook is saved. You should see the CSV file you just created. Click the tick box next to the file and click Download. We can now head over to the EY Data Science platform and upload this file as our first submission. Lastly, if you're done with work, don't forget to navigate back to the Azure portal and switch off your VM. In this Getting Started Guide, we try just one simple image processing operation, thresholding. I encourage you to test out other image analysis techniques, such as what you might find in the other notebooks that are available. You could also use more advanced image segmentation data science techniques, or even create a neural network. Good luck and have fun.